Down. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Design from Scratch Live, where we answer your questions about the show. I'm your host, Matthew Encina, and today we are recapping episode two, which is how to give and receive feedback. And you guys gave us tons of very sharp and poignant feedback, some of it painful. Thank you. Constructive, mostly. Thank you. Anyways, I'm not alone. I'm joined by three lovely people. If you guys can introduce yourself. Hey everybody, Ben Burns, you guys know me. Hi, hey, I'm Jamie Van Warren, I'm the designer on the website. Hello, my name's Sang, I'm art director here at the Future. Yeah, and some of these people you guys haven't seen on a live stream before. Sang's been working here for many, many years and this is his very first live stream, Corona. In the, in the shadows. He's like Min, you know, <laughs> hiding in the shadows all the time. So I just wanna open it up a little bit and uh, Actually, before we get to that, I want to give you guys a little rundown of the show. So first, we're going to do a little recap of the episode and just get warmed up here. And we're going to answer the top questions that you guys have posted in the comment section on yesterday's episode. And we're going to turn it to you, the live audience. So as we're having our discussion, make sure to drop your questions in the comments below. And our team, Ricky, is going to be reviewing your questions and then surfacing the best ones for us to answer. So today we're talking about feedback and receiving criticism. It's tough. I think as a creative person, you put so much of your heart and soul into your work. And then you put it up for judgment. You put it out there publicly. And especially for us, I think as designers who are trying to show as transparently as possible all the things that we do here at The Future and at Blind, our service company, we're living a fairly public life. So it's exposed to almost 600,000 <laughs> of you every week when we release an episode. And it's, it's not easy. We get lots of feedback, lots of compliments. Thank you for that. But also sometimes feedback. In this particular episode, we got a lot of criticism. And it was, it was very hard for me to personally stomach at first. But how do you deal with that? And there, there's a question that had popped up um, I want to actually go to the first question, and this is from Hard Styles Gamers. He asks, how do you not take it personally when the other person is not into the design? I love how you look at me, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie is like, hot potato. <laughs> this, is, this is something I still struggle with. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not the greatest at giving feedback, but I'm also not the greatest at getting feedback. So even as something as small as like YouTube comments on some of the videos that I make for the channel, I mean, there will be three, 400 comments and all of them will be positive except one. And that's the one that I spend most time thinking. So it's like, you know, whenever we, whenever I create something, I put a lot of my heart and soul into it. And so it's, it's, it's hard for me to, to get that kind of like passionate detachment or, or I should say the, the detachment part right. from, you know, the work. So that's something I still struggle with. I don't really have a good answer for that. There's nothing you've been doing to like w actively work on that? No. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> that's not great. Let's work on that. Then. Let's work on that. What about wounded. you, Jamie? Yeah. What about me? Um, I actually think that I've, I've become much more detached from taking things personally in the past, since I've been freelancing. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm not as invested anymore in having authorship or ownership over the idea. And um, I don't know, I think it helps to, to really try to empathize with the client. For instance, there were quite a few times where there were, um, you know, we'd, we'd butt heads a little bit on the, the visual design. And I found that any time that you had like a business goal or like a business reason to back up your argument, I was, mm -hmm. I was willing to take that a little easier. It didn't hurt me personally because mm -hmm. I knew there was some larger reason why we had to go in a certain direction. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I don't know. I like, I just really been focusing on my mental health and mm. um, trying to get away from the scarcity mentality and hold on to the things that are good while at the same time, just doing my best for the client and making sure they're happy. Because if you look at it from a big picture, mm -hmm. like you will not benefit in any way if the client's not happy. So I, I try to inject my own ideas into it but if it comes to the point where there's a conflict or another idea thrown my way as long as it can be defended i'm not going to take it too personally anymore right 
So what I heard from you is as long as there's a smart reason, intelligent reason as to why we are doing the things we're doing, why we're making the decisions we're making on both sides, mm -hmm. then there's no reason to argue. Yeah, that makes sense to me. There's no reason to argue. And if my decision is going to, I think it takes a lot to, to understand that if your decision is going to hurt the project or not help it as much as the other decision, then, then why would you fight back on that? You want to mm -hmm. be part of the winning team and not just, I think, win individually, because that doesn't really, yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. When you guys went through design school, because Matthew, you went to Art Center. Mm -hmm. I forget where you went. Cal Arts. Cal Arts, and then Sang. He also Art went Center. to Art Center. Yeah. Okay, so when you guys went through design school, critique was a big part of the curriculum there, right? Every day. And it was, I mean, can you, can you tell me about that? Like, that's something I never went through. And mm -hmm. I think that, like, you guys are pretty cool and calm when you're receiving negative feedback. And I'm kind of <laughs> wondering if that has something to do with it. Well, what I was think that experience like? Just building up a tolerance. <laughs> yeah, you, you build up that, that, that threshold, that pain <laughs> threshold of receiving feedback. Because the first time you get it, it's pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Second time, tough. Tenth time is probably tough. But if you have to do it every day for three years, four years straight, you kind of develop thick skin. And I think luckily within that envir environment, because it's a learning environment, the teachers are not, they're not clients. They're not there to harm you or to get their way necessarily. They're just trying to help you. That's why they're teachers. Mm. So because we're in that nurturing environment, most of the feedback is constructive. Yeah. And they try and offer up their perspective. It's like, well, what if we try it this way? Or what if we try it this way? I think it would be more effective if you did X, Y, and Z. So I think by doing that rigorous training over and over and over, you kind of get used to receiving feedback and you realize that the feedback you're getting is helpful, not hurtful. Hmm. So you develop it on both sides. You hear it and then you learn to give it. And I think once you become a professional and you get into the professional world, the difference is now there's a client who has money at stake. There's all kinds of stuff. There's, there's something at stake. There's the business at stake if this doesn't succeed. So inherently there's a lot more pressure, mm -hmm. right? So um, luckily we had the training wheels in school. The, the difference is with the clients, it's like there can be more emotion and ego involved. But I think as we were just talking about, once you focus on what are the objectives and goals, then it's much easier to talk about the work. Forget about what you put into it. Is it effectively doing what we need? Mm -hmm. Is the hierarchy clear? Is this a clear direction for how somebody can find the product that they need or the content that they need to consume? Right? These are all things that we've had discussions on inside our hour-long meetings, mm -hmm. trying to map everything out and evaluate all the design decisions we've been making. So that's I think that's the flip. You just go into what's effective right and instead of it just being about the craft which you focus on in school now it's about well what's going to help the business and the objectives of this project so do you guys still feel the initial sting of negative feedback like i'm interested in the emotions behind it because mm -hmm. i'm able to take the feedback it hurts but then i just work through the pain <laughs> you know like i just keep moving forward mm -hmm. so do you guys still feel that initial kind of flinch of kind of an emotional pain when you get negative feedback or yeah. was that beaten out of you in art school i will say that i think the teachers in art school are much more harsh than <laughs> any client i've had so by the time you get out of there and you've been crying for like four years <laughs> um in front of the whole class like the client is not it's more intimidating but it's yeah. not as hurtful especially because i think I, I bring a little less personal stuff into professional work whereas mm -hmm. in art school especially at cal arts it was a lot about being an artist and bringing your own uh, okay vision so i think already like the difference between art school and, and doing professional design work is a little different for me because it just i'm not as attached to it to begin with but i definitely it definitely still hurts my feelings yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah oh you I have think, something to uh, say? at school like it's your personal work actually yeah so you spend all night doing it and then in the morning when you go to class when you get harsh critique i think like that rip it off the wall I, and step on it so oh that God. certainly <laughs> hurts but like in the business world it's like it's not my personal work 
we're just trying mm. to do what client needs. Mm-hmm. So that makes me like less, um, it detached me from the project mm. more so than my personal like art like project from my school. Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. It sounds like we do all have a range in terms of how we respond to feedback. Mm-hmm. I will say that yesterday's episode went off and I was super excited to launch it, even though I'm not the one directing it or producing it. I'm the overseeing all the content and I'm just so excited about the series because like, wow, we get to express ourselves. We get to show what's behind the curtains and then the feedback that came in. Some of it was pretty harsh. Mm-hmm. And so for me, emotionally, like I was like, whoa, I feel something here. That's that's unusual. Normally, I don't really I'm not affected by the comments, but so what I've had to go through just in the process of yesterday to today in these more extreme moments is like, I recognize the feeling, like, what is it that I'm feeling? Do I feel guilty, embarrassed? Do I feel like I let people down, right? These are the things that go through my head. And then after it's like, I've compartmentalized, okay, I understand that's how I feel. Why do I feel that way? What Mm -hmm. is it that they said? And then I look through, I read through the things or I listen to the feedback. And I try and identify, oh, you know what? They said this, this is the thing that triggered me. And it triggered me because it's probably true. I was feeling this in my gut somewhere. Mm. So now I have to understand that. Yeah, so it's like, I'm just looking for those key words. Where are the moments that somebody is saying something where it's, you know what, it's actually true. Yeah. And then once you've identified that, now those are just words on a piece of paper. Emotion's already gone. And I'm looking at that. Now, what action can I take to either rectify this, change this, or iterate and improve on this on the next version of the thing that I do. So that's the whole big process that I go through is when I feel something, there's the shock there, especially if it's, if, if it sometimes feel vindictive, but Mm -hmm. uh, usually it's because there's something under the surface that's actually true. Getting to that point is the most productive part and kind of ignoring the emotional part is, is a thing that I think a lot of creatives waste time on the more time you spend focusing on how you feel about the thing and putting energy into the negative part versus spending the time on the things you can control and have action towards like you once you can shift over to that to the action part then you're going to be way more productive and move on with your life a lot better and the more you exercise that the more you can detach from the personal connection to the work i think I totally agree with that. I feel like lately, as soon as I start feeling kind of bad about like a decision I made or like I get feedback that they're not into it, I I try not to like dwell on it Mm -hmm. because like I I feel like that's kind of like a shame space for me and like I do not Mm want to stay in the shame space. It feels Mm -hmm. awful. So I I feel like the best way to do it is just to like keep moving, do something else that's going to resonate with them and, and get back on the right track. I think mm-hmm. the sooner you can get back on the right track and stay out of your head, like that can, I, there have been a couple projects in my life that I think having that negative feedback and like my self shaming is kind of like tainted the whole project mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. And I don't want that to happen because I think what comes out of that is usually like, you know, they've been good projects. And for some reason, like I can't, reconnect with them because of how I felt back then. So it's, it kind of like discounts all the hard work right. you put in and you need to get out of there before it's too late. Right. Right. Absolutely. And it's, everyone has a limited amount of energy. And when you get consumed with the, all the negative stuff, it's like you're not productive anymore. You're not making, and you're not moving forward. Right. All right, let's move on to the next question. Cause I think it's a good segue. And this is from CF Slalden. I'm going to butcher the names. I'm sorry. It says, how, how do you keep yourself motivated and how do you gain enthusiasm when you feel super frustrated? Saying you've probably been working on this project (laughs) the longest, I think out of everyone. Um, have there been moments of frustration on this project? And then how did you get motivated again? I mean, sometimes you have a plan in your head. Okay. I'm going to make, how many pages in this week. Mm -hmm. And then as you start working on it, it's not as easy as what I planned. And you get frustrated and I feel like, oh, I'm stuck and I'm not doing my job here. Like, I gotta get this out. Then I think you gotta stay away from that moment and then do something that you could actually, like win, like small wins, like Mm. easy stuff. Okay, I'm gonna leave this frustrating part 
as is right now. Mm -hmm. I'll solve it later. And try to solve, okay, this is something that I could kind of like knock it up pretty quick. And then I think once you start to do like something that's like manageable for you, like you could control it, then you start to gain like confidence back. And I, that's how I do it. Mm -hmm. So I try not to get stuck when it's like frustrating and like I just don't want to look at it. Just right. walk away. And walk away. Just let it sit for a little bit. And mm -hmm. then like you have more clarity and like I think that's how I deal with the frustrations. Mm -hmm. Especially this project. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much to do, big and small. Yeah. What about you guys? How do you regain the I think, motivation? I think chasing motivation is in and of itself a bad idea because it's such a fleeting emotion. You know, the feeling motivated is something that, you know, you get at the beginning of the, of the project and then maybe right there at the end. Mm -hmm. It's the in-between stuff that you just have to sit down and get to work every single day. So for me, it's, it's about... It's, it's not about like trying to wake up every morning with the sun shining and feeling motivated. And, you know, I'm, I'm not living that Instagram kind of life, but, you know, I just, I just try and figure out what I can get done today. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that a lot of the frustration, especially in this project came from, um, just goals that were so huge and, mm -hmm. uh, grand that we really had to kind of like scale them down. And so if you find yourself like feeling frustrated in a project, I would take a look at like what you're trying to accomplish and see if you can cut it in half. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, I, I brought that up several times in this project is like, okay, if we can't get this done, let's cut our goal in half and see if we can accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And so we slimmed this thing down to an MVP and we're just going to launch it section by section. So I think that, setting the right goals in the first place, but also realizing if you set a goal that's too big is really, really important. That'll keep you from being frustrated. Yeah, I think what I've noticed, what we've been doing collectively here in the office and what I've been doing personally myself, just because I'm, I'm exposed to these guys, is we realize like we set really big astronomical goals for ourselves. We have great ambition for ourselves and it, it's, it's massive. And what we've been trying to do is like, the frustration usually comes from us coming up with ideas of things we'd like to do. So mm -hmm. it's a new to do. And then the next day, new to do, new to do. And we've gotten to this point where we're the third quarter now in the year, or this is the first year that we're running the future just on its own without our service company. And we've realized that our to-do list is massive. Mm -hmm. I think you did an exercise with us two weeks ago where you, you talked to every person in the building and mm -hmm. you just got a tally of all of our to-dos and there's probably a hundred things on there. Yep. No wonder we're frustrated. Yep. No wonder it's been challenging. So I've been, and then, so what you did is like, okay, what can we eliminate? Let's just say not right now yeah, or not at all. Does this even realign with our goals for the business and what we're trying to accomplish here? So you cut out like half of them. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is like, well, what can we push off till later? Took some of those off of our plate. It's like, what can we accomplish in the next week or two? Yeah. And it's like, let's get those out of the way. Yeah. So now we've minimized this massive to-do list and just kept it very reasonable. So like um, saying was saying earlier, you have quick wins. Like you just win, click. And mm -hmm. for me, I've realized just being around you guys, the thing that drives me nuts is open to-dos, open loops. And so I've been personally actively, I've listed out all my personal to-dos. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like every week, I just put a few on on the week to do yep. check those things off and I don't move on. I don't take on anything new until that, that to do list is done. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I have a same kind of sheet. It's a notion document that literally has one column of unfinished projects, another column column of unstarted projects and then a finished thing. And the greatest joy in the world is dragging <laughs> something into the finished thing <laughs> or just hitting the delete and right. just, <laughs> not doing that thing. But. Right. <laughs> All right. So speaking of goals, since it seems like that's super important for us to help realign and just regain objectivity when we're, we're looking at the work or doing the work, we have a next question from Noah and it asks, what does success look like when building this website? What are the tangible results that you expect to happen 
through the site. And I know these are little things that we kind of grazed over a high level, but maybe Ben, if you could just help give context to our audience, what is it that we're trying to do with this website that it hasn't yet? So the website is, is really where we make money. Mm -hmm. And so the first goal that comes to mind is to increase our conversions. Mm -hmm. So literally um, pull in more revenue from, from sales. Mm -hmm. um, the second goal is to provide just like the same quality of content on the website that we do here on mm. YouTube. And so those are the two big goals. Um, I think in this first phase, it's just getting something out there that we can edit and tweak over time. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of comments about like, uh, why are we not testing this with users and stuff like that? And we like to test things in the real world. We like to market test mm -hmm. uh, what we build. So this first kind of phase MVP is we're, we're hypothesizing that the changes that we make are going to make it easier for the users to interact with the website. And that's the first hypothesis. And we're going to watch and see if those kind of key metrics change over time. Bounce right. rates, conversion rates, time on page, that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then we're going to react to the numbers. You know, we're going to iterate and test this thing over time. Right. The MVP, though, is really getting something up that we can edit quickly. Right. That's good. And those of you guys who don't know, I mean, we're all designers here. We're all creatives here. But Ben is the person who's meticulously looking at all the numbers. So he has spreadsheets on spreadsheets that connect to other spreadsheets <laughs> that break down every single page on the website, all the traffic that goes there, where the traffic is coming from, how long they spend on the page, and then the conversion rate of every single page. He has that all documented. So we have all these crazy baselines. So he could tell us if did this new design <coughs> improve the conversion? Yeah. Are we getting more traffic because of how we're being found or how we're pushing to our website? All of these things are, are things that would take hours and hours and hours to explain to you guys on a single episode, but we spend all the time reviewing these numbers. Luckily, we have somebody like Ben to surface the important stuff for us because <laughs> I get to do it. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, like I said, we would iterate on our current website if we could, um, but we can't. We don't have a developer in-house, and that would take a lot of time and a lot of effort to make small changes. And so mm -hmm. the MVP is let's put the new design on it, let's brand the thing, let's get away from using a stock template and mm -hmm. make it so that we can make those changes really easily in the future right. to affect those numbers. Right. Yeah. All right, what I'd like to do now is move on to the live Q&A. So you guys have been dropping questions there, and I believe Ricky has pulled up the best ones. Only two. Only two questions. All right. So what's the question number one? Will design from scratch episodes change based off of feedback from episode two? Thank you so much for asking that question, Helen. Not really. We're trying to actually finish the series. I think it was very clear to me that we just need to wrap the series. So next week, it's the last episode. Yep. We're just going to get this done and we're just going to iterate because honestly, the biggest challenge has been getting the website done, documenting that, forming a story around that, and then putting it in some tangible form that you guys could see and react to while we're trying to juggle all the other things. So unfortunately, episode three is pretty much in the can. It's pretty much done and the feedback that's received is just what are we going to do with future content what was the negative feedback about the episode because i'm kind of dying to know <laughs> yeah i was I, I watched it and i've read through the comments so i kind of have an idea but if you could summarize mm -hmm. what people are, were looking for and what they didn't get yeah so i think for us our big goal was to show behind the curtains what it's like to work as a designer it's not glamorous yeah this is about the people and then the interactions about building a website. I think a lot of people was were expecting building a brand, but for our website, meaning we're gonna be very elaborate with the process and break down everything and teach every single moment about mm -hmm. building the website. So it, part of it- So more like more design and technical? More design and technical. So I think a lot of uh, the way that we framed it, that set a false expectation 
when people watched it, their feedback was, I thought it was going to be that. Mm. So because we didn't frame the episodes or what the series is all about clearly, I think that's where the misalignment is. And that's really all, it's funny that we're talking about this now, that's how all relationships are broken or made is based off of expectations and your ability to meet those or not. Because the more you don't meet expectations, the more your relationships get broken. Mm -hmm. And the more you're able to do that, the more alignment there is and the more mm -hmm. friendship that you I can have. I feel like that has huge repercussions for how you handle feedback too, is mm -hmm. what your expectations were. So I try to have few to none more interested in the goal than like my personal expectations. Mm -hmm. But if, if you set your expectations high, like in any area, like ch you, you're, there's a really good chance that you're gonna end up being disappointed. So I try to just, I feel like being open is, is kind of the way to go. Right. So I think that's why there's been some negative feedback. Mm -hmm. It's because we didn't do a good job of setting the expectations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because so the whole point of this thing was to document and entertain, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we weren't out to educate people on the pro process and all that kind of stuff, but that right. seems like what they were expecting from us. Right. Yeah. So we have to do it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do it all over again, Jamie. Come on back. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's start over. Let's Revision uh, number 47. Oh. Let's it's, it's yeah. interesting that we're getting this like negative comments and we're talking about detaching with our work. I think it's perfect because <laughs> yeah, it's the meta became a meta conversation in itself. Yeah, it's so meta. <laughs> no, it's good. And, I, and, and the thing is, again, like I said, some of the initial stuff, it stung. But I know these are people who are well intended. Maybe they don't just use the right words or craft it. Uh, well, but I know that their their intentions are good because they just they want us to do these things. But all, a lot of it is our fault for not setting expectations clearly. Yeah. So let's go to the next question. <clears throat> Before we do, I want to clear something up. Mm -hmm. It is October third today, and the website is not live yet. So I saw a lot of comments coming through that were like, "Oh, is this the is this the new website? It's WordPress. What are you guys doing? No, no, it's not live yet." We're saving that for the final episode. Right. So next week we're going to launch yeah. the website. <laughs> All right, let's get to the next question. Is it ever okay to criticize a peer, boss, or creative director's design? No, never. <laughs> it's never okay. Do you understand saying? <laughs> Not in Ben's presence. <laughs> Not in Ben's world. No, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Of course. All the time. I mean, we have all these meetings with Chris, the owner, the founder, uh, both blind in the future, and we challenge him all the time. Yep. All the time. Whenever something doesn't feel right or we have an alternate point of view, we challenge. And we don't challenge just to say, like, I don't like green. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, there's green. You know, what about um, um, the brand attributes that we defined? Does it line up with that thing? And then we talk about it in that way. We talk about objectively how is this handling uh, what we're trying to accomplish so it just all goes back to that so we're able to do that respectfully without making it sound like we're just trying to be a dick towards him right mm -hmm. like as if we were to say like chris no 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 that design is whack he's, he's gonna get defensive yeah right and the more you use language like that or you're trying to say you're trying to put a little bit of salt on that thing, or you're trying to say you, 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 mm -hmm. then it starts to feel accusatory and it feels like you're trying to attack the person. But if you use language that says we, I think we can do a better job at this. I think the design could benefit from changing X, Y, and Z. And then now you're talking about the work and you're talking about us as a collective. I think that's the difference. A lot of people like to take ownership as what uh, Jamie was talking about earlier, where it's like, this is my design that I made for you. So if you're talking to your clients and stakeholders and peers and bosses that way, you're trying, you're already creating division between what you've done for them. But if you just change that language and say, like, here's the thing that we made together, here's what we talked about, and here's how it's represented through what I made, then all of a sudden it's like, we're making this together. And then you're inviting that person in. So if you, it's, it's a slight tweak of language, but you could tell just by using that, it doesn't feel like it's me and you, us versus them, but it's us collectively. Yeah. I think also like 
<clears throat> talking about like when you're challenging someone, I think using language that kind of like opens the door to like possibility is is really helpful. I find that this, I mean, this is a little bit different, but when I teach my students, sometimes they get a little defensive, you know, like I stayed up until four o'clock in the morning doing this and you're just gonna like crap on it. But when you say like, <laughs> well, you know, what if, like, could you imagine if, mm -hmm. you know, and then they kind of, they take a second and they think like, oh yeah, like I can see the possibility in this other direction. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that really helps at least with them. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging hard work too is, is also important. It's like, I know you spent all night on this thing. Yeah, or even just saying like, I love this part about it. Like this isn't as strong, mm -hmm. but like what if, you know, then it's right. like they can take the thing that was strong and, and think about this new thing maybe. And, and it's just, it's, it's a little more like optimistic than just, you know. Right, and I think feeling like that's the end, like that that's the decision. With that type of language too, as long as you're leaving the uh, option of choice for the other person, they don't feel trapped. Because right. if you're talking to another person and you're saying, you have to change this red, it's kind of like, okay, then the next time you tell me something, I'm just gonna say, just tell me exactly what to do I'm, and I'm gonna stop thinking, I'm gonna resent my job, I'm gonna stop exercising my creativity. But with language like that, you're saying, what if it could be like this? My recommendation is we can go this way, but it's up to you. You can explore other options of this as well, but my goal is to do this. So you're trying to leave these open um, possibilities of choice. This is very important for human beings, especially for creative people, because if you trap a person in a box and you say you can't be anything else, that's where people get frustrated and want to wiggle out of that thing, right? But if you're leaving them the ability of choice and making recommendations based off of your aligned goals, your relationships are going to be a lot, lot smoother. But in, in reference to like critiquing your boss, I mean, I've led creative teams here for a couple of years now on several different projects. You've been part of more than one. Mm -hmm. How many times have I come to you for advice about typography and like, I'm looking for a typeface, but I don't know. <laughs> Tons, right? Like, yeah. I, and I think that that two way street is really powerful in a team environment. Um, and I always find working with order takers really, really boring mm -hmm. because I can come off really strong in my opinions. But like Chris says, it's like strong, opinion, uh, strong opinions loosely held. I can, my mind can change like that. <laughs> Seriously. Right. It's like, oh, yeah, if you don't like that, push back. I'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. And so many fresh ideas come out of, you know, interns coming in here with a different aesthetic. And mm -hmm. I, I just love that. So sometimes you just have to, like, make the thing, too. Like, mm -hmm. if time allows, like, it's sometimes easier just to show rather than try to convince someone verbally. So if you've got an extra hour and there's a direction you want to, sometimes I just, I'll be like, I just, you know, did this as an option. Right. Cool. All right. I think we want to keep the, uh, the show pretty tight um, based off of your guys' feedback from last week's episode. <laughs> so we're going to start to wrap this up. Uh, let's talk about some quick announcements. Uh, if you haven't yet and you're in the LA area, don't forget to come out to the office next week on October 9th. 7 to 10 p.m. We're going to be doing Building a Brand Live. We're going to have the Hamiltons over. Um, ben, the whole crew is going to be here pretty much. We'll be answering your questions, and we'll also be drinking beer. You should have led with that. I mean, should have led with that. Like we'll be drinking beer thing. together. <laughs> um, yeah, set the right expectations. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Jeez, there's going to be tons of beer. Mostly beer. Great beer. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Josh is going to teach us some stuff about how he makes the beer and like what to look for just because going to his brewery was been it's it was awesome learning all that stuff so happy and excited to share that all with you and if you haven't heard it yet we're going to be at adobe max later this year mm -hmm. um, so buy your tickets if you haven't yet and lastly like we mentioned earlier next week is going to be the last episode of design from scratch so we'll be releasing episode three next wednesday you'll see the grand conclusion of all of this and You'll also see our website Let's launch. Say. So we're all excited, <laughs> nervous. Um, we, we have a whole page for you guys to be able to report bugs to us. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give us your feedback there. That's where it's going to go. Yeah. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're going to wrap the episode here. If you guys want to follow us, you can see our uh, handles there. You can follow any of us that uh, were on the episode today. And uh, we're going to lead out this 
episode with a preview to episode three. Oh. On the next episode of Design from Scratch, we are headed to Developmentville, where Sang is the mayor and the sheriff and city council and well, well, you get it. It's all on him now. I'm kind of scared because I'm the one who has to build it. So. Oh my God. Oh my God. I think I need support. Oh. All right. What do I do? What do I do? Am I doing this right? I don't know, bro. Oh, if it doesn't turn out well, it's on me.